want to, so I'm going to go through issues with defect, uh, defect tracking, issue tracking, and I'm going to try to motivate the use of defect tracking systems rather than systems like Discord. So, um, uh, and I'm also going to be discussing stages of a bug's life. I'm going to be discussing some of the dynamics of defect discovery, things that come in there, and um, some of the terminology that, that uh, has been built up in the industry over the uh, past bunch of decades by best practices. Okay, um, let's talk about um, uh, defect uh, tracking systems. There's, you know, I was working with some of the first generations of defect tracking systems in professional development in the 80s. Um, and uh, they were just getting sort of formulated as, as what tools can help us as developers maintain information on the defects we encounter. Um, uh, and these days, you know, there's been a whole progression over, over decades among uh, JIRA and Redmine and Track and Bugzilla. And of course, GitHub issues is, is the main one for now. Now, it, it pains me almost physically to hear people talk about, you know, using Discord for, for referring issues and, and notifying people of defects. It's not that this is sort of no purpose. I mean, after all, um, Discord is a very flexible place to communicate back and forth. My lab uses it. Um, and I use instant messaging all the time. It can even be valuable for, you know, it can be valuable in all sorts of areas, even being aware of a top quiz, for example. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, um, Defect tracking systems have a huge set of advantages compared to instant messaging. What give give me a few suggestions for areas where like a formal defect tracking system, let's say GitHub issues for, for not not um, not not privileging it, but uh, what advantages might that have? Right. What's that? Exactly. Okay, excellent. Right? I like this. I actually didn't even have those in my list, but one of them, the archivability, is, is something that contributed to one of the items in my list. So that's that's actually very valuable to have this history. Now you can argue that um, you can search in a lot of chat systems. You can you know, save away some components, but Marmot had his hand up as well. Uh, it's easy to see all those uh, defects in one place instead of like scrolling through. Um, yeah, yeah. And you can see defects that are open versus closed in another one. Uh, yes, well, how? You can assign them to people. You can assign them to folks and, and assign them in a way that allows you to follow their comments on them, right? Um, how about other, other advantages? You're right. Good, good, that's right. Um, so you can have a, a template. I'll talk about a little bit about some things that we have in the template. So set some expectations. Other items? Yes. Uh, that's right. So Artisan uh, uh, has noted like um, there can be through labels, for example. Um, Labeling and some systems you can actually assign explicitly priorities versus severities of defects. We'll come back to this distinction in a minute. Um, but those can be very, very important when it comes to what's called triage. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit too. Um, so good. These are, these are some basic reasons. I mean, there's, there's lots of other, right? You can have image attachments to these things. You can have markdown comments on them. You can label them. You can mark them as duplicates. And GitHub issues, you, know, you can actually say like duplicate uh, number 1021. And it will, uh, it will recognize that 
You're saying there is in fact a duplicate relationship, so you won't double count that, right? That's really important in what's called standardizing the bug. Terminology will come back to the problem. Um, assign team members. Now, you can also do commits that are linked to particular issues, right? So you can you can make a commit that indicates I'm committing to to deal with this issue, right? To resolve say this issue. You can be uh, trying to be notified about these things, right? When when someone goes and updates it, you can be notified uh, of this. So you can subscribe to notifications, right? If you have issues. And you can automatically close issues when you say something like fixes number 101 and did not. It'll actually close that issue, um, which is hint, right? To not have to go and and just remember to do that. Um, that's really valuable because in older systems, sometimes issues would stick around long and kind of zombie issues that were really closed, but no one had marked them as such, right? And you can accumulate statistics. This is you know, sort of archiving and, and maintaining this information. You can get statistics of how many you know UI in, uh, issues are still open, for example, um, still active. Um, uh, and that can be really valuable. So, you know, in terms of tracking things, there's, if you look historically, and I think these are, these are good distinctions, um, you know, short title prioritization. Um, prioritization uh, is a matter of assessing the value of things and, and, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the degree to which you're determined to fix it. Severity is an indication of how bad it will is if it occurs. Why why is that, why might something be high severity but not high priority? Can anyone say? Like what, why might there be something that's really high severity, but it just is in this category like desirable, but it's probable, or extremely probable to fix it? Yeah, uh, yeah. It seems that very unlikely to happen. Yeah. Certainly, I like that it happened. Yeah, what does that Yeah, really hard or risky to fix, right? And it might score functionality. Um, it might be, you know, such an old type of system that this occurs that it works in iPhone fours or something, which are basically not seen anymore, right? And and so again, it's improbable that it will actually come up. Um, all of these are, are good reasons. Um, uh, you may have uh, discontinued support for that, for example. Uh, a reproduction one though, so this is you know a way of, of recreating it, right? Um, who it's assigned to the area of the project, labels a lot of used for this, right? GitHub issues is a UI one, this is a back end one, a database, what have you. Now, traditionally, there's actually been some finer grain categories that GitHub directly supports. And there's movements of foot to broaden GitHub's binary classification closed versus open. Um, but uh, sometimes people like to distinguish things that were closed because they've just been accepted versus closed because they've been resolved or fixed. Um, Sometimes there's a distinction between things that are viewed as resolved by the developer, but not necessarily by the reporter or tester. So the idea is that developers say, hey, look, it's resolved. And then it has to be double checked to be closed. So again, historically, the distinctions are often considerably finer grain than GitHub issues supports. But GitHub issues has factors in it to move in that direction. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we, we indicate whether it's a regression bug or a or sort of regular bug. Again, what does regression here mean? What would a regression mean? Yes, yeah. Uh, it was working and now it's not again. Good, yeah. So it, it has been working and, and now it's no longer a Danny the you want to see what it is? Yeah, exactly. It, it stopped working. And, and that could be an old bug that's resurfaced, right? 
but it could be a new feature of the world in all ways. In novel ways, yeah. Um, and again, sometimes we distinguish, you know, is this going to be triage or are we going to, to fix it? So creating these reports is it's not like it doesn't just fall out of the sky that you create the you know you you really want to create a lot of these in a in a thoughtful way you don't you don't want to deal someone with you know accusations their code is broken you want it to be somewhat neutral uh, but you want to be able to reproduce it easily and so often there's like structured exploration to, re to make it appear really quickly and reliably. Um, you might want to include images that show what it looks like, because describing it is sometimes a lot harder than the particular you know, picture of it, right? Um, a picture should be worth the thousand um, words. You might also want to compare it. Did it occur in the previous, you know, the previous deliverable, for example? Um, condense it, disambiguate it, et cetera. And often, you know, review it if it's if it's an important. Um, okay, um, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, I I will say those using. So remind me here, which teams are using containerization? Team two, I think, is primarily right. Yeah. So containerization is an incredibly valuable technology in today's development for certain types of software. Too. One of the things that makes it trivial is this ability to ensure that testing occurs with respect to the same the same exact setup. Because one of the earlier issues, which kind of got to be the focus of some DevOps concerns, is that um, you know the tester sometimes wouldn't have exactly the same test environment as developers, and so an issue would come up for testers. That wouldn't appear for developers, or different testers would have different environments, and they couldn't reproduce it. Containerization can both give a totally standardized environment and ensure that when you undertake the test in that containerization, you're not screwing up the system or otherwise changing the external state in a way that will change the results if the test gets run again and again and again. Because one of the bugbears of earlier generations of test environments is you run the test, and if you don't restore the test environment to the original test environment, um, what would the problem be? Can anyone say? If earlier generations of testing didn't restore back the state of the system after running the test, what happened? Yeah, so so you might run it once, it doesn't work. Then you run it again, it does work. Because maybe some temporary files got created or something that allow it to work now. And it's really hard to reproduce. So for full reproducibility, containerization is 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 very, very valuable. Um okay. Um I want to talk a little bit about. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons that um, reproduction of, of bugs can be challenging, and containerization is is you know a a, a good solution for for many of these. Um, so I want to talk about defect dynamics of defect discovery. Um, so this this is a graph from NASA showing on the x-axis weeks of testing. So tell me, how, where would a year be? How many weeks in a year? Yeah, so it'd be like this is one year, right? This is like two years, three years, yeah. Um, these are three different systems. Does anyone recognize what these are? Voyager, Magellan, Galileo. They are starting not show, getting getting good thoughts, but they are yes, well. Right. Where is there the extra over system? Yes, it's outside the solar system. Magellan and Galileo were probes also sent out for planets like uh uh to uh to go around Saturn, around Jupiter, and beyond. Um the plane here which went before Voyager is also outside the solar system. These are systems that are 
designed to work for decades um, if nuclear propulsion, uh, of nuclear fuel to power it, I should say, as a pellets of, of fuel, and they um, and they need to be reliable. Like doing patches on these things, it's not easy. You can't send like someone out there. Um, for obvious reasons, right? Elon Musk's, you know, roadster, not, 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 right? It's not that kept up the Um. So this is a graph of defects over time. This is defects per thousand lines of code. A lot of effort went into correctness of these lines of code. So can anyone tell me what are some what are some uh, features of these things? Um, put, put down your name, and you'll get a few points. Um, okay, so um, so give me some features that if if you look at this graph, what are some things that strike you? There's actually many features of this graph if you look at it closely. Yeah. Okay, so this is in operation, but this is, um, yeah, so this is since it was, since the code base was first worked on, this is discovery over time. So this is not how long it's been in space necessary. It might have been long, let's say, for Galileo, you know, at one or nine or something. But, um, but uh, yes, yeah, so it's the projects last a long time. But you've only this for a long time. Yeah. The, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, the number of defects compared to how long they were tested. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what about the number of defects? Small. Okay. So, so look at it like eight per thousand lines of code is pretty good, right? Pretty good. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not like a hundred per thousand lines of code, it would be scary, right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Three discovery is one point. Ah, okay. So the rate of discovery initially goes up faster and then they kind of plateau. It's, it's a bit early to see for Magellan, but like for Galileo, it looks like it's, it's rising, but it's not rising anymore. It's accumulating, right? This is you're counting up, you're tallying up how many of these things are, so they can only stay the same or go off, right? They're never going to be um, but, but it goes up faster initially and slower later. Why might that be? Why might it be that it goes up quickly at first, but then it gets slower? Give me some reason. Yes. Uh, fixing one bug might help or Bingo. So identifying one bug might help you identify others. Why? Why is that? Yes. Other bugs might be of similar nature. Yeah, they're similar nature. They're similar kind of classes of issues, right? Buffer overflow. Um, it's used with SQL injection security, right? Or maybe performance issues associated with failure to handle timeouts properly. And you find several examples of that. Or you find, you know, uh, a, a failed handling of concurrency so that it's not thread safe. And you discover it here, and then you find, oh, there's three other cases like it where we didn't take into account that thing. Okay, so, so these things bring their friends, right? Like, Finding one helps you find a class of them. And so you get these kind of spurts. But there's another reason too. Yeah, yeah. yeah how many of these are the areas that you can spend the hour? So, so, say that again. That there are more new features in the areas that you can Okay, but so you're doing a lot of testing with new features here. And not so much here. And so there's rollout of new features. So that might, you've got lots of new stuff to test. And then later, not quite as much. But there's actually one key reason that comes up. And it's actually not specific to defect discovery. It comes up in a lot of areas. Uh, yes, Matt. Is it because 
They what? They write tests. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. the amount of time you your goal and dedicate to testing is more than afterwards. Okay, so you're writing it early. Yes, kind of early. early. And so you kind of uh, find the defects that are identified by those tests early. Yeah, that could be. No. Yes, Bahaj. Um, could it be that uh, developers can get more and more familiar with the code base? No. Yeah. So they get more familiar with the code base. So at first, they're making good discoveries. Okay. So I think all these things are, are good reasons. But there's a final good one that's been bigger here. And, uh, people tend to discover the easy thing first. Okay. People discover the easy thing first. And the ones that are more obvious get discovered early, and the ones that are hard to discover, subtle, nuanced, difficult to, to sort of burn out, get left to later. I said that this occurs in a lot of areas. Uh, another area, for example, is oil discovery. So, discovery of sources of oil in the world. Guess what was found early on? The big reservoirs of oil. They found like big areas where oil is. Then it got harder and harder to locate oil, and they come up with more and more clever ways, you know, like these. Drilling things, they can drill vertically and then horizontally, and, you know, ways of breaking up shale and stuff like that, tracking, you know, all these ways of sort of ferreting out oil from tougher and tougher places. The easy ones get discovered first. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, a key part of making progress here is. is that I'm getting okay, you know, how can a similar uh, mistake be avoided? But how can we find them more quickly? And, and finding finding things quickly, um, we can often generalize the discovered defect to find similar ones to it, and and learn. It's not just fixing an issue; it's how can we um, discover other similar issues? Okay. Um, I'll come back to this notion of, of directed triage. Directed triage is actually going through and figuring out uh, bugs to, to prioritize. I'm, I'm going to come back and talk to that. So I want to uh, introduce for you another construct, which is stages in an SDI point. And it has to do with this discovery of defects. OK, um, so if you think about it, bugs. Defects go through many stages in their life. If you think about real life bugs, you know, you may have heard of dragonflies, they have larvae, and they have pupae, and then they hatch into adult dragonflies. Same thing with, with mosquitoes, right? They're, they're in a larval form before they become mosquitoes. Um, larvae, pupae, um, mosquitoes. In terms of defects, bugs and software go through similar class. There's actually more phases. Um, one of the ones that's most important, but hardest to directly measure, and that's next to the other to measure, are undiagnosed defects. What do I mean by this? So let me ask you, your project. Do you think you have any defects in this undiagnosed stage? That's not. <laughs> so often there's a lot of it here, right? Um, what helps bring defects from undiagnosed to diagnosed? What process? It is not a trick question. Yeah, right. testing. testing, right? Testing, but not just testing. What else besides testing? Yes, I think. 
Okay, okay, so use like end user use or, you know, yeah, use of the system, maybe not formally testing. Um, might, might discover, but there's another key thing though, yes? Uh, Sorry? Code review. Code review is fine. And in fact, code reviews find faults. Testing find failures. Hmm? Maybe I'll stand up here. <laughs> code reviews find faults. They find the underlying defects. Test it, ladies and gentlemen. Fine. That finds the, the, the symptom of the defect. Once you find the symptom, what you have to do is find the fault. You find know, like the symptom in testing. What do you have to do to find the fault? What is that from? The fault. The bucket. The bucket. So, testing finds failures in all the bug reports. It's a bit of a misnomer, but right there, there are often more failure reports, right? The system broke here. It's actually not necessarily identifying the underlying defect, right? The underlying defect may be the same for several types of failures, right? Maybe there's a no, uh, maybe there's a loose pointer. Let's see. Folks are innocent of C, right? How many people here take a free search too? Maybe not entirely. Um, uh, but um, you can have loose pointers and they can do all sorts of mischief, right? All sorts of havoc. They could cause it a failure over here and over here and over here. The same underlying problem, the same loose pointer could manifest in different ways, right? Um, and similarly, a failure to handle. Duplicate entries in the database might come out in this side of the system, which enters that information and sorts it this side, which creates reports from it this side, which searches it. it. Might come out in all sides, right? Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, often, you know, we have bug reports, which often will relate, some of them will. Relate to the same underlying defect, but they also will often include duplicates. Why would it include duplicates? Why would why would defect reports like you might create a GitHub issue? Why would they potentially include duplicates? Yeah, right. Yeah, different people see the same failure. Like they see that they see similar issues, and they report it right. Um, so that's a good reason they might they might report it, right? Maybe they even report it with different versions of your system. So maybe it was reported for ID two, but then it was reported for ID three as well. And maybe maybe it gets reported for ID four. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Duplicate defect reports can occur, right? Um, they can also be outdated. What do we say outdated? Why can, why can this include outdated? Give me a reason that uh, a perfectly good issue that was issued, a perfectly good issue that report that was created some time ago, you know, GitHub issues may have been a great one at time, but now it's outdated. Why would that be? Yeah, geez. Okay. Removal of errors, so that's why you yeah, so removal like of a, of a certain template. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so that's what it works, right? It's what you see that standing around. Um it's but it's okay, right? Um I was deciding to like know it and God uh, and, and you know it's not about and, and so now now it's outdated, right? It's it's obsolete. It, it's a moot point because it's gone, right? Okay, okay. So so it doesn't take too much imagination to think of this, right? Um uh, and there can be defects also here. 
that are based on misunderstanding. Could that be of the system? Could there be a defect that is based on misunderstanding how it should work? Yeah, I mean, like sometimes a tester is thinking this should give this answer, but it turns out that the requirements are such that actually, you know, this is the correct behavior for it. Maybe they don't know that the video being played is actually has no sound. And they say, this, this video has no sound. The sound, you know, the audio is perfect, but it turns out the video doesn't have sound. Um, it's possible, right? So, so they're based on this understanding. Um, maybe it's being run on an unsupported platform. You didn't realize that it's not designed to run on Android tablets, just on phones, or not no phone model with a screen less than a certain size, but they try it and report it a defect. But it's actually by design, you know, they're pulled out. This poor performance of the system included in this category. Uh, yeah, you could say that if uh, you could put a defect in that, uh, for example, there's a timeout, right? Um, and the timeout shouldn't occur by performance guarantees the system is supposed to meet, but but it does, and it leads to an error. And so someone could say that was a bug, reasonably, um, because it's not supposed to occur, of course. Really, it should handle the timeout more gracefully, but it really shouldn't occur either. Yeah. The example that I was thinking is not necessarily a timeout because the, that the system is just thinking too much crap. So, yep. but Good. I, guess, I guess there's another word to describe that, which Good. is uh, that it enhances. Um, so, like, yeah. yeah, it's like you just make your your code a little bit better. Right. Not a range of the thing. Right. 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 Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it could be that that leads to a failure, which is the system no longer works properly because it's run out of memory, right? How I fail. <laughs> you want to say that? Yeah. And, and, it, and therefore, an error condition occurs, right? The, the user experiences an error um and really uh it's due to poor design um or poor implementation um like it's allocating memory without printing it or just kind of using some sort of modern memory that, that it doesn't need um okay so so bug reports are created but bug reports are not all there's all this trust in them on there for the actual Issues the initial report, and there's a process, and it's a term in the industry called sanitization, where these these defect reports become they undergo curation. They become yeah, they you remove things that are duplicates, outdated, based on misunderstandings, right? You might find too that. Not only are different, but they're actually the same. Um, once you look at it, it's just two sides of the same point, right? Um, and you know, you mark them as duplicates, et cetera, and you get out active bugs. So this sanitization budget, which is a very testable thing, that sort of thing could could be tested on a jam or even on a pop quiz. Um, right, so standardization is turning kind of raw bug reports into active bug reports. And then there's a decision about whether, you know, for triage, are you going to fix these? Why, why might you not want, why is it a no-brainer? Why, why not just always fix bugs? You find bugs, you always fix it, right? And they can just, uh, and it takes too much time to get something about it, but it's versus the ones and it's more important to Good. So I like how you answered that. And there's, you sort of wove two things. First of all, you said there might not be time. And, and that is an important thing. I'll come back to that in a second. But you also said, you also referred to the notion of opportunity cost. Can anyone tell me what is opportunity cost?
Yes, for yourself. Yeah, choosing one way gives up the other. I'm told, I'm not a Latin scholar, but I'm told, I'm told that the word in Latin, decide, to choose, right, means to cut off certain options. So by choosing A, you're not doing B or C. And that has a cost. Right, you're foregoing that opportunity to do an A. And writing is exactly right. If I fix A, I may not be able to fix B and C. And in fact, if A is really tricky to fix or or takes a long time to fix, I may not be able to fix B, C, D, E, which could be, you know, much worse. Right? Huh, those could be much worse. So, so what reason is it made? Take one and it may the opportunity cost is not worth it. What's another one for you? Yes, for example. Okay. Um so this one might be a knock on one from something more severe. If and if we just fix the more severe one, maybe this one, the final one will disappear, for example. Yeah, so I, you know, we think that. This one is kind of kind of an indirect consequence of that that other issue. So, so that could be. How about another thing? Right. Okay, unlikely to happen. So it's low priority to fix. It might be serious, but low priority. Priority versus severity. Remember, severity is not bad and it's going to happen. It's priority also considered likelihood and overall importance, right? How committed we are to fixing it. Um, but it's also going to be risky. Why do I say it's risky? Why could why could fix you with this? Uh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a notion in software of the fault feedback ratio. Fault feedback ratio. And basically, what this tells you is for each bug you fix, what, how many bugs do you create? For each defect you fix, how many do you create? Any sense of what this might be? So, yes, uh, for quite more or less. Yeah, it can be that high. Yeah, particularly for large things, it can be that high. Um, like, 50 lines of code or more or something. You're, it's quite probable, quite, or quite possible, sometimes even probable, that it can, you can generate a device. Why might this be important? I want to get back to the writing point, but there don't be times to come. What? Don't be important. Why would it be important to say, introduce it to the part of the part of the part of You may need to just be taking about a minute. Yeah, why did this be a problem if you're running out of time? Yeah, because you made the answer, you know, you're taking your tail. Okay, there's a degree to that, but you might not even get the point as well. You might not even have time to locate the fault. Well, this one is the W times. You know about this bug. You can write work around for it, you document it. How a lot is good to know, know about this, and, or we know how to handle it. But if you go and fix it, that's the only thing you don't know, right? Because you might introduce two bugs said that you don't know. You can't write a work around. Can't double us. Right? And and that can be bad, right? Believe me, it can be bad. Okay. Um so so you could run out of time to fix it reliably, and it could be better to, to hold off from fixing it. The bugs you introduce may be worse, right? They could they could be higher severity and higher priority. Um, so these active bugs, you know, will often include defects that are too risky to fix, too minor to fix, that's not worth it. Or we don't have time to fix them. We don't fix them. There's really these important bugs that 
more than you know uh, feasible that we go hand on. Now, here's the thing though: the bulk feedback ratio. When people go and and fix these bugs, these are assigned to developers. They have these; they're working on them, and as they're working on them, they might generate new ones, right? And these new ones that they generate, do you automatically know about those? No, right? You, that's the thing. Like, you, you want to get ahead, but as Marmik said earlier, you might be, no, it's Wahab. He said it, I think. You might be chasing your tail. You might be not, might not have time to, to uh, do it back. Catch up, right? Because you go to fix and you're generating new ones. And these are the devil you don't have. And that, that may bite you. Okay. Um, so those are a few key things. And, you know, hopefully we get through when we fix. But remember, as we're fixing, we may generate these. Um, we're going to talk in this class soon about ways to estimate the size of this undiagnosed problem. Not only are we going to talk about it, you're going to undertake this. On your project. Mm. Fancy that. Um, <laughs> oh, I want to hear these details with, with John. I would be so happy if you tell me you estimated, you found some, you estimate that there are some undiagnosed defects. Like, wow, what a great job you did. Diagnosed. Don't worry, I'm not that. I'm just keep it. Um, but you know, I hope you realize testing is peer review, particularly peer review is very efficient in putting through, through to provide the correct reports. And actually, peer review can often help us as well avoid outdated defects and and you know um, make sure that they're based on up to date understanding and so on. Um, and it'll help, help us find really important ones. But ladies and gentlemen. Time has run on, and now is the time for a pop quiz.